again to Willie, Jackie and Neil for coming night after night and accompanying us as we worship the Lord together. It's glorious to see the place packed again tonight. We have nothing but the word of the Lord and we praise God that God is honoring his word and many souls. We know of at least 18 that have trusted Christ as their own and personal savior and we pray that tonight again as we turn to God's word we'll see others turning to the Lord himself. Now, we have said that tomorrow night in the will of the Lord, if, if the Lord tarries and we're spurred, that we'll be looking at the subject, the great white throne of judgment. And so we just want to mention that. We're looking at the judgment of the great white throne. And this is something that I believe that we need to preach in these days, because once you have really been given eyes to see what's going to take place there, I don't think you will ever want to be there in reality. Now, tonight, of course, you may know that we said that we would be dealing with the subject, why should I believe in God? Because so many of us in our past, we knew what it was to be scoffers of God's word to be those who would argue about God's word. And more and more in these days, I'm running into people who ask this question, why should I believe in God? The anti-God theology has taken root in our schools and universities with the result that whenever souls realize in a crisis experience that they can't make it on their own and that they do need help, they always put God last on the list of possible helpers. Just like the woman you remember with the issue of blood. She spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but she rather grew worse. And then she turned to the Lord Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. And you women that do a bit of sewing know that when you put a hem on the garment, you finish the work. And she touched that which spoke of the finished work of Christ, and she was immediately made whole. Yes, we always put God last on the list of possible helpers. And I remember doing this in my own life. I honestly believed that it would have been wonderful if there really had been a God. As a matter of fact, if there had been a God, and if the Bible truly had been his word to mankind, then I felt that I would have been the first to obey it. I would have rejoiced in it. It wasn't that I didn't want to believe in God. Of course I wanted to believe that there was a God. It wasn't that I wanted to believe that the Bible was a fake. No, I wanted to believe that the Bible was true, but I couldn't. For me to believe that, then I would have to unlearn all that I had been educated to believe. I would have had to commit intellectual suicide. I would have had to turn my back on a thousand questions and arguments about evolution and UFOs and outer space, and I would be required to accept primitive stories about Adam and Eve and Noah and Jonah. In other words, I would have had to forsake the voice of my own reason and accept by faith that which seems foolish to me. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, and there are those of us who know that we're saved, Unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. It pleased God by the foolishness, the seeming foolishness of preaching to save 
them that believe, we read in verse 21. And you see, that's just it. There must be an element of faith. And so many hearts today are filled with unbelief. Now, I know that you're praying just now as we're preaching because these hearts full of unbelief will be drawn or distracted by the least thing from the Word of God. And only the Word of God and the entrance of God's Word will give light and life. And the devil will do anything in his power to keep people from listening to the Word of God. And so the believers are praying just now as I'm preaching and there must be an element of faith involved if you're going to be saved. Why is this? Why has there to be an element of faith? Why can God not just come out into the open and show us himself and, and, and then we'll come to him? Well, you see, man was lost in the first place because he disbelieved God. He believed the devil's lie. The devil was telling man that if only he would eat that forbidden fruit, then he would be like a God himself. And when man turned away from God, then he believed the devil's lie and turned his back on God. And God requires that we now do the opposite if we're going to turn to him again, only this time through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and sacrifice. You see, even turning back to God is no good unless you're turning and repenting before God of the sin and the sins that have been involved in your turning away. You see, what the devil was suggesting seems so reasonable. And mankind must repent. Mankind must come to God, turning away from his sin, believing his word to be true, believing the devil to be a liar, receiving Jesus Christ, our Savior. And listen tonight, I want to tell you why I think you should believe in God. I want to tell you why you should acquaint now yourself with him and be at peace and thereby good shall come unto thee. And I want to turn with you to the word of God in Genesis, the book of Genesis, the book that the devil hates most of all, and the first chapter, please. The first chapter of Genesis, and we're going to read a few verses, verse 6 to verse 8 of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament. Now, if you've got a good marginal Bible, you'll see that it says in the margin there at firmament, it says expansion, expansion. God said, let there be a firmament or an expansion in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, not the clouds from the waters, but the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And so God is actually creating what we call the atmospheric heavens here. This is the place where the clouds are. This is the place where the birds fly. And God is creating this expanse, but he's creating this atmospheric heaven between the waters above and the waters beneath. Not the clouds above and the waters beneath, but the waters above and the waters beneath. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, if you'll turn into the middle of your Bible to the book of Proverbs, just after the book of Psalms, and we're looking at Proverbs chapter 8, please. Proverbs chapter 8. And what we're going to read about here is no mere attribute. We're going to read about wisdom, but it's the hidden Christ. Indeed, he's the one who has made unto us wisdom. We're told in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so we're reading about the hidden Christ just now in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 22, please. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled. Before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth nor the fields nor the highest part of the dust of the world. 
When he prepared the heavens, and we're only after reading about God preparing the atmospheric heaven, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass, now if you've got a good marginal Bible again, it says in the margin, when he set a circle, remember there was no rainbows yet, because rain was one of those things not seen as yet. When he set a circle or a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, so you can see he's not talking about the clouds above, when he talks about the circle, when he talks about the compass, because that's a different thing altogether, the clouds above. Matthew Henry said he surrounded it on all sides with that canopy. Matthew Henry knew a thing or two. Verse 28, And when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. There never was a time and there never will be a time whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was not in the bosom of his Father. Now we're turning for our last reading to 2 Peter chapter 3. The last reading at this point in time is 2 Peter chapter 3. Right at the back of your Bible, please, if you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Thank you. I remind you that Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't like Paul. He hadn't received that education at the feet of Gamaliel that Paul had received. No, just a fisherman at Galilee. And here he's writing under the divine inspiration of the Spirit of God. And he says in verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 3, This second epistle, beloved, he uses the expression beloved when he addresses born-again believers. He's talking to Christians, saved by grace, redeemed by precious blood. And he's telling them here in verse 1 that he desires to stimulate their spiritual meditation and to rouse them to honest thoughts. That's exactly what I'm doing with you tonight. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. You see, he's talking about this second epistle. That just means this second letter. There was a Sunday school teacher once asked their class, what is an epistle? The wee boy put up his hand. He said, yes. He says, it's a wife of an apostle. <laughs> well, the epistles are not the wives of the apostles. I see some of you are using your uh, chorus books tonight again with the fan, but I have asked the gentlemen if they'll watch the heat, and I'm sure they have the fans on, and I'm sure they'll be looking after you. I know it gets a bit stuffy after a while when we have a crowd, but we can be sure that we're being well looked after in Ebenezer. And so in verse 2, it says that ye be, may, may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So you can see here, he's talking about the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. That's the Old Testament scriptures. And then he is putting his own authority on the same level as the Old Testament prophets. And he says, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. You can see here that Peter is making it absolutely clear that he's speaking with the authority of the Lord behind his words. Never forget that this is God's word that we're reading. Never forget that God's word, the scriptures, are God-breathed. Some people say to me, it was men that wrote the Bible. How come you put your faith in fallible men? Listen, friend, we're told in God's word that men were the instruments used. Yes, just the way you and I would take up a pen to write a letter. But it's not the pen that writes the letter. It's you and I. And the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, we're told. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. The Spirit of God was inspiring this simple fisherman to write these epistles, to write these letters. And in verse 3 he says, knowing this first, that there shall come. Now he's emphasizing the future tense of the words shall come. There shall come in the last days scoffers 
walking after their own lusts or following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of his coming? You see, they're not heathens. They're not pagans. They know the scriptures. They know that the Lord Jesus Christ has promised, I will come again. And they're saying, my granny said he was coming again. Her granny said that he was coming again. And her granny said that he was coming again. He's certainly taking a long time to come. I was one of those scoffers. That's how I know the way they talk. And you see, these scoffers, and there are so many of them around today, they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're uniformitarians. They don't believe that anything ever changed from the beginning of creation. So you can see here that Peter's talking about these last days in which we're living, the last of the last days, the closing days of the church age. And Peter knows, uh, way back in the first century AD, whenever he's writing this, that the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just coming back that night or anything like that. Now, how did he know that? How did Peter know that the Lord wasn't coming back that night in his day? Because the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And our Lord Jesus Christ had given Peter a special personal revelation concerning his death. In John chapter 21, Christ said, Verily, verily I say unto you, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This speak he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And Peter, as soon as he heard the Lord Jesus Christ saying the words, When thou shalt be old, he knew that nothing was going to take him young in life. He knew that he was going to live to an old age. He knew the Lord just wasn't coming before he was an old man. He was going to live to a ripe old age. When thou shalt be old. That's why he was able to sleep like a baby in the execution cell in Acts chapter 12 whenever James had been slain and Peter was going to be brought out the next day and put to death. He was sleeping like, like a baby because he knew that he was immortal until the job was done. And in verse 5 he says, For this they willingly are ignorant of. Now can you be willingly ignorant? I believe there are people listening to my voice just now and you're ignorant, but you're willingly ignorant. You're willingly ignorant. This they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth, listen carefully, standing out of the water and in the water. Here's that circle again. Here's that compass again. Here's the earth standing out of the water and in the water. As it says in the New Testament in basic English, Lift it out of the water and circled by the water. I want you to get that picture into your mind. And he says here, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. It wasn't a local flood. The whole world perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, that is presently, by the same word, the word of God, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Oh, no, the Lord's coming again, all right. But his long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is holding back so that you can get saved. So don't you be despising that and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Yes, we can see that Peter here is taking on these unbelieving infidels, these scoffers, of the second coming, who are saying that nothing has changed from the beginning of the creation. They are uniformitarians. And he pins them to the wall, using the facts of the flood. And he's saying, you've overlooked one small point, haven't you? Or rather, you've deliberately and dishonestly put it out of your thinking. You're willingly ignorant of the fact that God sent a flood in judgment. Did you forget that? 
a flood upon this old earth, a flood that gurgled down the throats and into the lungs of every breathing thing on earth, except for eight souls and a few animals in an ark. Friend, you know fine well that God sent a flood, but you've conveniently forgotten. And by the same token of God's word, that promised the judgment of the flood was coming, we now know, Peter says, that the judgment of fire and perdition is coming upon your ungodly heads. And just as sure as the flood came according to God's word, so will the fire. You say that nothing has ever changed? Nothing has ever happened since the creation of the world? What about the flood layer? Friend, it can be seen, for example, in our world today, in Ur of the Chaldees. The archaeologists, the geologists worldwide, they know about the flood silt. They don't deny that there was a flood. They know there was a flood. They can't deny it. But they're willingly ignorant of it. They don't talk about it in their textbooks. You see, we read together in Genesis chapter 1 about the creation of an, ex an, 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 an enclosed expanse. There was water above. There was water beneath. I told you we called that expanse the atmospheric heaven. It was being created on the second day, you'll remember. And we read in verse 6, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. But we read our preconceived ideas into it, and we believe that it says, He separated the clouds from the waters. It doesn't say that at all. There's a great water canopy being made right round the entire earth here. Remember rain, we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, was something at that time not seen as yet. So we've got to stop reading our own preconceived ideas into God's Word. God is forming a great water canopy that encircled and enveloped the whole earth. It may have been in a vapor-like form, we don't know. But what we do know is that this water canopy insulated the whole world, the whole earth, with a worldwide tropical climate right up until the days whenever it collapsed. We're told in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11 that the windows of heaven were opened. Obviously, a vast overhead reservoir is being released as well as rain. And the subterranean fountains of the deep were being opened up, we're told. And then when the water canopy was removed, the north and the south poles, where there is no sunshine for six months every year, was suddenly frozen with the cold air rushing in from outer space and froze the waters into vast icy continents. We also notice the fact that God is introducing order here. Some people think that order is a waste of time, and that's why there's no power in their life. You know, Mrs. Thatcher could take up a swag bag. And she could walk out of number 10 Downing Street tomorrow. She could say, Great Britain, solve your own problems. I'm finished. And she wouldn't have a care in the world as she would head down the country lane. But she would have no power. If you want power, there must be order. Just look at the power that's behind God's order here. If I was to throw a bucket of water into the air, what would happen to it? Well, all these people in the front seats would be soaked for a start. But seriously, it would come down flat upon the earth again, wouldn't it? It wouldn't stay up there. It would come crashing down. I know that there is the gravitational pull. But listen, friend, water weighs 773 times more than air. You knew that, of course. And th therefore, the, the water would just come crashing down to the ground again. Now, let me say this to you. The amount of vapor that is continually suspended in the air above us is estimated to weigh... 54 trillion 460 billion tons. I couldn't keep a cup of water in the air. God keeps 54 trillion 460 billion tons of it up there. How does he do it? Friend, the annual fall of rain and snow upon the earth is the equivalent of 186,000 cubic miles, enough to cover the entire earth to a depth of three feet. If everything that was up there came down, the whole planet would be covered in three foot of water. Think of the power that's required to constantly lift this weight of water by, by the solar power that men are starting to work with at this time into the atmosphere by the sun, lifting all this weight off the earth into the atmosphere. And then with this in mind, let me remind you that this was nothing at all in comparison to the unbelievable 
liftoff that's taking place in Genesis chapter 1 verse 6 to 8. As God is lifting the waters by his power and creating a whole canopy around the earth. Let's remind our hearts again. It didn't rain. It didn't snow on the earth at all up until this time because the earth was watered by a completely different system altogether. We're told in Genesis chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth. And watered the whole face of the ground. You see that's the way things used to work. There was a mist rose from the ground. Now if there were no rain clouds pouring down upon the vegetation. What was it like? Well we've already seen the answer to that question. As we read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 6 to 8. But our preconceived ideas about big fluffy rain clouds bringing down April showers have stopped our ears from hearing exactly what was said there. You see, there was a lure of water. It may have been vapor, we don't know. Like a great canopy or an orange skin right round the planet. And this would mean that there was an even, warm, tropical or subtropical climate all over the earth. It was like a hothouse. There were no extremes of temperature at the equator or at the poles. And although there was no rain, yet there was an abundance of water. Not only in the form of a mist going up, but rivers that were probably fed by a subterranean source of water. We read in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11 about the fountains of the great deep being broken up. Now the whole earth must have been like a great tropical garden with lush vegetation and trees and flowers and no weeds, remember. Enough to support vast numbers of animals, great animals. Now let me stop for a moment. Maybe somebody saying, George, introduce a little bit of scientific evidence into this, will you? Is there any scientific evidence for what you're saying? Indeed there is. The whole earth abounds with scientific evidence for what I'm saying. I wouldn't have wasted my time talking about it unless it was so. Do you know that five million, and I'm saying it slowly, five million mammoths have been discovered, buried, scattered, frozen so quickly that they still have buttercups in some of their mouths and their stomach contents haven't even decomposed. Five million mammoths. Have you ever seen the size of an elephant? Have you ever seen the size of a mammoth? Can you imagine these vast creatures, suddenly five million of them being frozen in blocks of ice? I want you to think for a moment. I want to bring this down to our level for the housewife in the meeting. Could you imagine tomorrow morning in the Glasgow Herald or whatever your newspaper is, the headline that last night in Ebenezer Hall in Erdry, suddenly a packed hall with hundreds and hundreds of people in it, they were suddenly frozen in a block of ice with their polements still in their mouths, some of them. Oh, I'm watching you all right, don't you worry. Friends, what sort of a catastrophe would it take to freeze this whole hall? Then think of five million mammoths. What sort of a catastrophe would it take to freeze so suddenly five million mammoths that they still have the buttercups in their mouth? Where were they found eating this lush vegetation? Where were they found? In northern Siberia, in Alaska, and in the islands of the Arctic. Friend, where did the lush vegetation come from in those parts of the earth? How did those mammoths survive in those areas? Fossil corals have also been found there. Corals which are limited to water that is at least 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees centigrade. The little creatures that make up the coral need that warmth. How were they formed up at the poles? Friend, coal seams are also found near the poles, indicating that abundant subtropical vegetation and forests once grew there. Of course, you would know as well as I do that you couldn't have coal unless there once were forests there. At the poles? There's much evidence, of course, apart from the continental shelf itself, to suggest that some islands, now 1,000 fathoms below the surface of the ocean, were once above sea level. What happened? The flood happened, of course. The flood happened, friend. The awful events of that one year still affect us today. 
the climatic conditions of the whole earth were altered. The continuing earthquake activity that we have in Armenia and all over the world that persists today began back then. Man's lifespan was suddenly reduced to a tenth of its former length. Men no longer lived until they were 900 years of age. They were very fortunate if they got three score years and ten. The collapsed canopy that encircled the earth, the collapsed canopy that encircled the earth had previously had a shielding effect with regard to the harmful rays of cosmic radiation. And when it was removed, man's lifespan was affected. Have you ever tried to trace on a map the Garden of Eden? Have you ever looked at the Euphrates and wondered how it was parted into four heads? Forget it, friend. Because for you to find it, you would have to make a perfect model of the landscape involved and then let the tide out until those four heads appeared and you would be able to find the Garden of Eden. Peter asks the scoffers, as I'm asking the scoffers tonight, what about the flood? Why should you believe in God? What about the released waters? What about the released waters, friend? Archaeologists, geologists, Yea, even the ordinary layman can go and see the flood cell. What about the released waters? You can't deny their existence. You can't be willingly ignorant. You have your scientific evidence. You have your archaeological discoveries. I want to talk to you for a little moment or two longer about the willing ignorance of the anti-God theology. What makes unbelievers so willing to be ignorant about the things that they know to be true? Why do they seem to be so ready to turn a blind eye to the facts that are stirring them in the face. And yet they live so confidently in their world of make-believe and pretense and theories. Listen, friend, theories are for fairies. We're dealing with facts. J.N. Darby says, ignorance is generally confident because it's ignorant. I think that's good. Ignorance is generally confident because it's ignorant. I'm thinking just now of of a Christian who was taking out his Bible to talk to a wee woman over in East Belfast. She says, now you put that in your pocket. Don't you start quoting that book to me. I know it from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> Ignorance is generally confident because it's ignorant. You see, the reason that I've found some people are so willingly ignorant of the truth is because they're confused as to how the truth is to be approached. This book, my friend, is alive. I want to get that over to you. Peter the Apostle said, The word of God liveth and abideth forever. It's God breathed. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught that every word proceedeth, listen carefully, out of the mouth of God. Friend, that's deep. The men who actually penned the words were merely the instruments, the human instruments that were used. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so therefore the proper approach that the reader requires when coming to the word of his or her creator is an approach of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. It's not by reams and reams of scientific data. It's not by being logically convinced. It's not by having the right mental approach. No, it's faith in God's word, friend. That's why we understand the things that God has given us to understand. He hasn't left us in darkness. God has shown us a, a map of the future, never mind what's happening today. It's a glorious book we have. I used to think that this was a dusty old book. And there was nonsense in it. Let me tell you, friend, this is God's precious, infallible truth. It has transformed my life. Twenty years ago, I remember a, a man at the end of my own uh, tether, as it were, a man who had a broken mind. I was in a living hell on this planet for seven long years. I could find no peace. I looked for peace in drink. I looked for peace in herbalists and hypnotists and chemists. And spiritless, I went everywhere looking for peace and could find none. But every time I thought of turning to God, I said, no, nonsense. That religious stuff and, and men with black garments on chanting and echoing their voices in, in chambers that I can't understand what they're even speaking about, that's no use to me. It's no use to me giving me a book of envelopes and telling me I have to pay. And, Friend, I need help. 
And listen, Scotland needs help tonight. And God's word is full of that help. And I remember at last turning to the Lord with a broken marriage, a broken mind, broken health. I remember turning to the Savior, a man who was definitely heading, not only for the divorce courts, whose children would be heading for foster homes. A man who was heading, I believe, with all my heart, and I'm not being melodramatic, a man who was heading for a potted cell. That's where I was going. Make no mistake about it. That's why I'm over in Scotland telling you. It's not because this is the way I get my kicks. I can't help telling people. Listen, I remember coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm going to take this book, the Bible. I'm going to believe with all my heart and mind and soul that this is your word. I'm going to throw my all upon it. And Lord, if it lets me down, it goes in the bin. It goes in the bin. I can't believe in fairies. That was 21 years ago. Hallelujah. It's never been in the bin, friend. It's a wonderful, wonderful book, this Bible of ours. And I tell you, it has a wonderful, wonderful author. Yes, do you know there came a time when the Lord saved us? And not only brought us to himself, but blessed us as we told people about the Savior. They were coming from marks and parts all over Belfast to our wee house up in the cul-de-sac up the Castlereagh Road. There were 40 in one month that trusted Christ. People were getting saved. All the drags of society. Their lives were being transformed. It was wonderful. Then God told us to sell the home. It took me a long time to realize it was God was telling me to sell the home. Because really, I tell you, friend, I thought I was never as happy in my life as I was in that home now. There was no way I was leaving it. But it was the Lord. We sold the home. We were waiting to see where God would have us to live. I thought he was going to give us a bargain of a big house somewhere where we would get more people in and tell them about the Savior. After six months, the Lord told us that we had to give that money all away to the poor. Everything that we had was in that wee home. Are you buying your own house, sir? We owed £300. It was only an average house. It's worth about £28,000 today. £300 we owe. God said, now you give it all away to the poor. We told the story last week. We're not going to go into all the details this week again. But let me tell you this. When God had eventually shown us who we had to give the money to, the man arrived at our door the very night that we had been told that we had to be out of the house by the end of the month. And I remember telling that man who worked with the poor afflicted people, people with multiple sclerosis, people who were uh, needing a holiday from the Lord. He would bring them into his house. He would pray and look to God to meet all the needs and he would provide for them and wouldn't charge them a penny. A man who lived by faith, a man called David Raby. There's a book called The Twelve Stones about this story and they have actually just reprinted the book and uh, they have called it A Faith That Goes Further. And so if you buy the book A Faith That Goes Further, that's a wee commercial I'm putting in. I didn't intend to do that. But you know, David Ravy was sitting in our house and here's this man that God had told me to give all the money we had to too, for his work among the afflicted. And the very evening we'd been to telling the Lord that morning in Wednesday, we said, Lord, we'll give it all. All. Would you make us meet this man? Would you make him cross our path? That same day, the man who had bought our house sent his brother to see if we could be out by the end of the month. Now we had no money and no house. And the man at 10 o'clock that night arrived at our door. We give him the money as God told us to give it to him. And he revealed to us that God had told him he was going to give him a big home for afflicted people where he could continue to pray and look to God and God alone, not making any appeals for money, not getting into debt, not asking sideways, only asking up. And then the people of Northern Ireland and beyond would know that there's a God in heaven who's hearing and answering his prayer. I said, David, where is this place? He says, I haven't got it yet. Oh, you've just got the money for it. No, he says, I have no money. I says, but you're only after telling me that God has told you when he gives you this home, you have to give me your house. I was standing with no house. Here's a man has come from 25 miles away to tell me that God has told him to give me his house. Nobody knew the position we were in but God and my wife and myself. He says, George, I have to exercise faith in God just as you did. And he says, that home is yours now, even though I have nowhere to go. Because you had to give away all that you had before God met your need. 
God gave him, sir, Lord, the carpet millionaire's house down at Donegal D. Swimming pool, a place that's worth hundreds of thousands of pounds today, friend. He didn't get rich quick, it belongs to the Lord and the Lord alone. And he brings in hundreds of people down through the years. Now he's with the Lord, but his family continues on the work. I'm down in Randallstown. We, we saw so many people saved. We had nowhere to put them. And we started to build a new hall with 30 shillings. Did you ever try and build a new hall with 30 shillings? We didn't believe in making appeals for money or making a need known. We didn't believe in getting into debt. But the Lord flooded in the money and we built a place to meet. And that was about 12 years ago, 14 years ago, God told me to leave my job and come and follow him. I had three big sons, every one of them, I always say, eating more than an Alsatian. You know what it costs to keep a home, missus. And 14 years ago, God called me, a man that couldn't preach or teach or anything else, out to follow him and trust him to meet all my needs. I've never had a bill I couldn't pay. I've never told anyone of a need that I have. Never, and I never would, by the grace of God. Never. That would be a denial of my faith. God has provided all our needs over these years. Friend, you want to know why you should believe in God? I'm telling you the truth, that's why. God has supplied all my need, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Maybe you're saying you got rich quick, George. You got a house given to you that was twice the size of the one you give away. Friend, when I got the deeds, I give them over to the little group that were meeting there. I don't own a brick. Not a brick. What do I want bricks for? To throw them at each other in the bog side in Northern Ireland. I don't want bricks, friend. I want the Savior. But I'm only sharing these things with you to tell you that God is real. I know he's real. I'm not preaching to you out of a textbook. I know that what I'm saying to you is true. But I also know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we are told that the natural man, the unsaved man or woman, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Maybe you're saying, look, I can't see how God could tell Moses things that happened away back thousands of years before he was born. Let me say this to you. Prophecy works in both directions in history. God reveals not only prophecies, things that took place thousands of years backward in time, but he also reveals things that would take place thousands of years to Moses forward in time. Let me say this to you. Multitudes of these prophecies have been literally and historically fulfilled in our own lifetime. We dealt with them one night in our meeting. You ask me, why should I believe in God? I say to you, because of the revealed word of God. There shouldn't be an unbeliever in the world today, friend. We have the revealed word of God. If I was to take you to Genesis chapter 1, verse 16, and show you Moses writing under the divine inspiration of the Spirit of God, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. How did Moses know that the sun was bigger than the moon? Have you ever seen a harvest moon? It's about ten times the size of the sun. How did Moses know that the sun was bigger than the moon? How did he know that there was only one sea? In Genesis chapter 1 verse 9, the lands and the continents are all divided, but the world seabed is one. Friend, Moses knew about the Dead Sea. He knew about the Red Sea. How come he only talked about one sea? How did John the Apostle know about planets? We'd be looking tomorrow night if the Lord tarries and we're spared. At that moment when the great white throne is set up and John saw the earth and the heavens fleeing away, they were out of orbit. People believed a couple of hundred years ago that the stars were only cracks in the ceiling in the sky. How did John the Apostle know there were planets? How did Peter know about water burning? How was Peter able to say a man who lived at Galilee the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. How can you burn a cup of water? How could you burn the Galilee? How can you burn two-thirds of the world? Isn't it sea? Listen, even a child in the Sunday school knows now if they press a button, it'll fry like an egg. But how did Peter know? Oh, if we were to take time and go into the book of Job and look at Job's discoveries, I thrill every time I see this man, Job. Job knew about the scientific, up-to-date news that we are reading today. The black hole, he knew all about it. 
He said in chapter 26, verse 7 in his book, speaking of God, he stretcheth out the north, that is a north star, over the empty place. And they now have discovered that there's a black hole over by the north star. How did he know about the fingerprints? Do you know that the fingerprint department that Scotland Yard started up began because of Job chapter 37, verse 7? He sealeth up the hand of every man. A British official in Bengal, India, had his attention drawn to this matter by the words of Elihu here. Another translation puts it this way. The Almighty hath put his seal of individuality on every man's hand. And the British official official began to explore and he established the system of fingerprint identification that is used all over the world today because of Job chapter 37 and verse 7. How did Job know? How did Job know about the oil wells and the oil springs in the North Sea, underneath the seabed, before Mrs. Thatcher ever heard of them? Before the oil companies ever came along to find undersea natural resources. How did he know about the treasures of a snowflake without a microscope? Have you ever looked at a snowflake under a microscope? Have you ever seen its treasures? He says, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Job chapter 38 verse 22. We could go on and on. He was a bit of a Doctor Who, one man said to me. Friend, you're a Doctor Who. He was, dis- he was under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Job knew that this planet Earth was hanging upon nothing. He says concerning God, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Job knew way back almost 6,000 years ago that the earth was suspended in space. How did he know? Oh, I haven't time to go on. But I'll tell you this, you can stand on the word of God. It'll never fail you, friend. It'll never let you down. In Isaiah chapter 43, if you look at it for a moment or two, Isaiah chapter 43, if you have your Bible there, and we stated we would do this particular study tonight. I want to explain that for the benefit of those who haven't been here before. We don't do a study like this every night, but we're looking at this tonight. And in chapter 43, we read, But now thus saith the Lord, this is Isaiah 43, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, this is Jehovah thy creator, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. So many are sitting here tonight listening to my voice. And you're saying to yourself, I would love to be saved. I would love to know the Lord as my Savior. I would love to have eternal life. I would love to have the peace that you have, George, and to know that I'll never be in hell. But what about tomorrow? If I come to the Lord tonight, what about... I couldn't keep it. That's what they say. Listen, here's the way God will talk to you tomorrow if you come to him tonight. As a matter of fact, here's the way he'll talk to you tonight if you come to him tonight. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. The sheep don't keep the shepherd. The good shepherd keeps the sheep. Then he says, when or shouldest thou pass through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. You see, this is God giving a promise, an overall promise of future deliverance for Israel. And not only for Israel, but look at verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Then God says this, and I want you to mark it. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes, and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? What a question. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is true. Ye are my witnesses, God says, as he turns to Israel. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Let me explain what's happening here, friend. 
This is a tremendous moment and a tremendous scene. This is God's challenge to the world. And God is standing the way that Elijah stood on Mount Carmel as he challenged the prophets of Baal to a showdown. Only God isn't challenging a few false prophets. God is challenging the entire nations of the world. And God is saying, you bring forth these blind people that have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Who are they? Who are the blind with eyes? Who are the deaf with ears? Well, we know who they are because of the previous chapter. God is speaking of the blindness and deafness of the nation of Israel in her unbelief. And in the same chapter, he speaks of the blindness and darkness of us, the Gentile nations. He's bringing the whole world in guilty before God. You see, mankind everywhere, including you and me, we are born in nature's darkness of soul. Born in sin and shape and iniquity. No matter where you're born, no matter what label people have stuck on you, God's word says, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've been born in sin. We've been bondaged by sin. And our ears have been blocked and deaf to God's voice. And now as God stands and faces all mankind in every generation from Adam to the end of time in their unbelief, he asks this question, who among them can declare this and show us former things? What's he saying? He's saying, who can foretell the future? Any generation you like. Any country you like, let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them say, as they hear God's word, it is true. Yes, I've said there are prophecies that go thousands of years backward in time, as well as prophecies that go thousands of years forward in time. And God is saying, who among you would like to take the witness box and tell me of any other God who has openly told all of world history in advance? God tells us in the book of Daniel about the Babylonian Empire, about the Medo-Persian Empire, about the Grecian Empire, about the Roman Empire. God fills in all the details. If we had time tonight to explore this wonderful book, and God is saying, friend, which God has ever worked with any nation on earth the way that Jehovah has worked with Israel? Show me any other God that has done it, or else confess the truth that there's only one true God of all. God is pointing the whole wide world and their unbelief to his God breathed eternal word, the Bible, the indestructible book that reveals God to sinners. You ask me, why should I believe in God? Not only because of the released waters, friend, because of the revealed word. It can't be destroyed. Jesus Christ, the son of God, affirmed 2,000 years almost ago, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. You have a greater foundation for your faith in God's word than you have for your feet on this planet. It's going to pass away. Many have tried to destroy it. Hitler burned it. But here we are almost 2,000 years later. And we can see the very words that Christ spoke. It's still the best-selling book in the world. And God turns to Israel now and says, Ye are my witnesses. Friend, there shouldn't be an unbeliever in the world today because of the returning wonders who for almost 2,000 years were scattered among the nations. Moses told them 3,000 years ago, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 63 to 67, before he ever had brought them back into the land in the first place, that if you turn away from God, he'll scatter you among the nations. He'll throw you out of Israel again. You'll find no rest for the sole of your foot. God told them this would happen, and happen a dead friend. Whenever they turned away from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, as they cried, we will not have this man to reign over us. And they crucified him outside the city walls. In A.D. 70, 40 years later, friend, Titus and his Roman army came up. And they built a wall around Jerusalem. And Josephus, the historian, tells us that the blood of the Jews ran deep. They crucified Jews until there were over a million Jews crucified. They had no wood left around the mountains and hills of Jerusalem. The slave markets of the world were glutted by Jewish slaves. The zealots escaped as some of them stayed in Jerusalem and ate their own children and starved there. They escaped all the way down the banks of En Gedi, along the Dead Sea and up onto that flat top mountain called Masada. And many of you have been there. I've been there many times. Next month, God willing, I'll be there again if he tarries in him spirit. 
I'll be over twice this year. And friend, on that flat top mountain, as the Romans encamped at the bottom and thought, well, we'll wait here and they'll fry like an egg up there. They'll soon be down. Two years later, they were still up there. Two years later. Temperatures of 120 degrees. They were still up there. They had plenty of water. They had plenty of food. And those Romans made that great earth ramp up that mountain and pushed their war machines. And at the top, whenever there were only ours until the Romans arrived, they had a meeting. They said, now within ours, your wives will be raped. You will be tortured to death. Your children will be taken as slaves. Or else we can die honorably now at our own hands. And when the Romans arrived in A.D. 73, the 15th of April, 960 men, women, and children were lying with their throat cut. I know about the bar Cockburn revolt in 132 AD, but let me say this to you. In a certain sense, Israel ceased to be a nation in 73 AD. In your lifetime and mine, friend, 1948, Israel was declared a state, became a member of the United Nations, and 40 years have passed, 41 years this year, since Israel went back into the land. Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37, God says, I'll bring you up out of your graves. I'll bring you back into your own land. Those dead bones will live. I'll raise you up a great army. They're not a big army. They're the greatest army in the world today, friend. Friend, Israel is back in unbelief, but she's back in the land. God told them he would give them back their ancient holy places. In Ezekiel chapter 36 in 1967, in the Six-Day War, God gave them access to all their holy places. You want to know why you should believe in God? The released waters, the revealed word, the returning wanderers. Need we go on and talk about the revolving worlds above us, friend, the planets? God's word says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Do you know if we were in a space shuttle just now and we were to go up and up long enough, this planet of ours would look like a football and then a tennis ball and then a golf ball and then a marble and then it would disappear altogether and then our whole galaxy would disappear as we would continue to go out. Do you know we would see a mass of stars like the Milky Way and if we went far enough we would see a great pinwheel turning in space taking 200 million years to turn just once at 136 miles a second. And the scientists with their radar telescopes know that there are billions, now I'm using my words very carefully, billions of those pinwheels. Is it any wonder that God's word says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. An atheist is the biggest fool in the world, God says. Anybody that stands on this planet and looks out at all creation and denies the existence of a creator, God says he's an absolute fool. An absolute fool. Yes, you want to know why you should believe in God? The meeting's over. I tell you, because of the released waters, because of the revealing word, because of the returning wanderers, because of the revolving worlds, because of the redeemed witnesses, I've given you testimony tonight to the reality of God in my life. I've walked with him for 21 years, friend. He has kept me, even though he called me out of my job and I couldn't preach or teach or anything else. The stories I could tell you. I remember it came to the moment whenever the land week money was done and the holiday pay was done and I knew it had to come. The moment would come when the money would be finished and then God would have to start to really work. And I remember that Saturday morning a bill came in for £35. The first £35 I needed and I didn't have. I had a peace because God made sure over three years when he was telling me it took three years for me to get it into my thick head. It was God telling me I didn't want to go out and maybe drag the name that I love most of all in the gutter because I'd made a mistake. I wanted to be absolutely sure. I was sure. And here I was now, 35 pounds. Where do you get 35 pounds when you're not working and you have a bill to pay? I went down the town. This is the truth. I didn't mean to tell this. I'm giving you one example. I went into a shop I'd never been in before in my life. And such an array of fancy goods, beautiful stuff I'd never seen anywhere in Northern Ireland before. And I was engrossed in it. I think I wanted something small in the shop. I forget what I was buying now. 
But I started to look at this stuff. It was beautiful. I thought to myself, where does this man buy this? And then I looked up and I saw I'd caught the man's eye and he turned away quickly and so did I. And I said to myself, now he thinks I'm a shoplifter. <laughs> and so I was before I come to the Lord, but not now. And I started to look a wee while longer, better not take too long at this. And then after a wee while, I looked up again and he was looking at me again and the both of us were well looked at we looked away again. I thought to myself, I better go up here. This man's going to get anxious. So I went up and I said, uh, could you give me such and such a thing? He says, I'm sure you noticed me looking at you there. I said, I did, but don't worry. I used to have a wee shop myself, and I'm sure you're plagued with shoplifters. He says, I knew you would think that. He says, I wasn't watching you because I thought you were a shoplifter. Don't be thinking that, sir. He says, look, have you been ever in this shop before in your life? I says, no. He says, can I ask you a question? Certainly. Are you George Bates? Now, would I tell you, nobody ever heard of George Bates now, but definitely nobody ever heard of George Bates there. And I says, uh, do you know me? No. You ever seen me before? No. I said, friend, you better explain this to me. How do you know then that I'm George Bates if we've never met and I've never been here before? He says, I have something for you. And he reached round and lifted an envelope. He says, that's for you. I opened it. There was £35 in it. I said, look, you'll have to explain to me what, what happened. Why am I getting £35? He says, George, I don't do credit. He says, if somebody had 10p short or 20p, I would say, give me it the next time you're in. And he says, I would write it in a wee book. But I wouldn't do credit. Can't afford to with this sort of stuff. And he said, every couple of months, if I get a wee slack period, I would go through the book and and I would scrub some of it and say, ah, that's six months old now. I'll never get that 10p. Forget about it. And, and he would bring forward the things that he thought he would get. He said, one day a woman came in and bought 40 pounds worth of stuff. Now, he said, I just don't sell 40 pounds worth of fancy goods. You don't do that. And I thought to myself, what's going on here? And he says, you took out a checkbook, filled in the check and give it to me. And I thought this will bounce, but it didn't. Next week she came in and bought 50 pounds worth of stuff. He said, this was great. Filled me in another check. It didn't bounce. Everything was great. He says, this went on for weeks. Until one day she came in and she got 35 pounds worth of stuff. And she says, I forgot my checkbook. And he said, before I could think of what I was doing, I said, look, give me it next week. And out she went and she never come back. And he says, every time I took that book and was going through it, he says, that 35 pound annoyed me. Until now, he says, here I am, two years later. He says, do you know my shop's always packed from 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning and it's now 10 o'clock and you're my first customer? I says, that's unusual. He says, it is. And I was going through my book and I thought to myself, look, you're only annoying yourself. Keep him putting that 35 pound forward. Scrub it out. And he said, it just says, Lord, I'd rather give it to that boy Bates I heard about rather than throw it down the drain. And he says, you walked into the shop. And he said, I thought to myself, surely this can't be that boy Bates I heard about working with drug addicts and working with the unsaved. And he says, you were. Now, that's a simple thing, isn't it? But listen, God can provide in a million different ways, and he's done it. Listen, friend, the redeemed witnesses can stand up. Not only the Jews, the Jews are not the only witnesses that God lives and that God is and that testify to his name and existence and power. This privilege is shared by all the redeemed people of God. The Lord Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This place tonight is crammed full of redeemed people of God. They are here. They're here, friend, all around you. We know him. And there are billions in God's family who will gladly testify to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. Yes, amen, brother. Why should you believe in God? Because of the released waters, the revealed word, the returning wanderers, the revolving worlds, the redeemed witnesses, the resurrection wonder. Oh, we haven't time to go into it, but I'll tell you this. Death could not keep its prey. 
Jesus, my Savior, tore the bars away. And up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain. And he lives and he's here and he promised where two or three are gathered together. In my name, there am I in the midst of them. Our wonderful Lord is here tonight. Forgive me for rushing. If we had twice the time, I would have talked more slowly. But we've got to get you home. And you keep on coming back no matter how long we keep you. You mustn't have watches, you people, in Ebenezer Hall. Thank the Lord for you. Friend, tonight, you should believe in God because of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look away to Calvary as we close. See from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and blood flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? This one did no sin. He knew no sin. Neither was sin found in him. Why was he there? He was there because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish in that awful hell, and it must be a horrible hell, sir, when you see what the Lord went through to keep us out of it, should not perish but have everlasting life. There had to be a God friend for Christ to be made a curse for us. It is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. This holy son of God had to go through the waste, howling wilderness of the loneliness and darkness. And the God forsakenness of Calvary as God in the darkness led on Christ. The iniquity of us all. And the Savior not only made a way as he carried our heavy load of sins into a land uninhabited. But he became the way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open where you may go in. It's at Calvary's cross. It's where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Listen, there was a moment in time when, whenever the Savior knew he couldn't claim verse 2 as a promise. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Friend, there was a moment when Christ knew he could no longer claim that promise. Because as he passed through the waters, as all the waves and billows of God's wrath burst on his head, and he sank in the deep mire of our sin where there was no standing on that day when the powers of the heavens collapsed and fell on the thorn-crushed brow of the Savior and the fountains of the great deep emptied themselves in hell. And he was ground between the upper and nether millstones of the wrath of God. And the deep called unto deep as Christ cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was passing through the waters, but God couldn't be with him. And as he walked through the fire of the wrath of God that you and I deserve, he walked the flames alone until his feet were like fine brass. When John saw them in Patmos as if they burned in a furnace. The only rivers that he saw in the desert were the rivers of his own precious ruby red blood. Friends, look away to that face. That physic marred more than any man. See the thorns pressing into his blessed brow. Flowing like a waterfall of blood. See his face where they ripped the beard in fistfuls. They punched him. They buffeted him. They spat upon him. His tongue is cleaving to his jaw with thirst. The Lamb of God is dying for you. There had to be a God. Why should you believe in God? Because of the redemptive work of Christ. He could still remember the whip. Cracking, lashing him till his back hang in sinless shreds. The Lamb of God was dying for you. And tonight the weary, wounded, willing, wonderful Lamb of God cried. Finished! Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Bowed his head and gave up the ghost. 
God had worked a finished work and none could hinder it. That same one who died rose again from the dead and many have come to him and have given their hearts to him in these meetings. Will you come tonight? He knows all about the sin in your life. He knows that the world has come crashing down around your head. He knows there are things that you took for granted and they've been taken away from you. He knows that the foundation of your life is being broken up. Do you know a better time to get into the ark? For I don't, friend. God loves you. Christ died for you. He'll save you. He'll keep you. If you'll only believe, where are you? Come to the sea. Come to him now. Let's bow our hearts before him. Believer, pray please. Pray just now. That the enemy will be bound and that the, the slaves of Satan will be set gloriously free. I believe God could save a man in this meeting tonight and make him a mighty trophy of grace that the whole of Scotland will one day hear about. If only he'll believe. Listen the Lord Jesus says, unless you're prepared to come as a little child, you can in no wise enter in. It doesn't mean you have to be the age of a child. The dying thief was no child. Many in the scriptures, men and women, saved by grace, but you've got to come with the simplicity and the faith of a child. Like a child going across a main road and just slipping his wee hand into daddy's hand and trusting daddy to take him over. Friend, tonight, the nail-scarred hand is outstretched towards you. Will you slip your hand into that nail-scarred hand and say, Lord, I'm a guilty sinner. I'm a hell-deserving sinner. But I want you to forgive me, Lord, and I want you to save me. He has promised the lips that you know you trust have promised him that cometh unto me her that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out take him in his word believe what he has told you he won't cast you out ask him to take you in just now ask him to receive you Lord forgive me and save me and remember, he promised down the door by me, if any man, any woman, enter in, he shall be saved. You can go home and know you're saved tonight, not because I said it. My word wouldn't count for tuppence, but Christ said it. And he's the Savior, isn't he? He's the one you're wanting to be right with. He's here waiting for you now. Ready, willing, able to forgive and empower you and bless you and deliver you. Lord, you know it's hard. As you look out on this vast congregation, you can see the drink problem. You can see the broken home. You can see the broken mind, the broken heart. You can see the crying children. You can see the distresses, Lord. You can see the bewildered minds as they're looking and wondering, is what this man says true? Oh, Lord, we thank thee that you are calling back. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We thank you that that just wasn't high-sounding words, Lord. You made that promise. I will give you rest. And bless God you can keep it. Save precious souls just now, Lord. Lord, bind the strong man and loose his captives. We plead the name and the precious blood of Jesus. And we pray that there will be many in this gathering just now. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. And believing that you have kept your word and that you didn't cast them out. 
you received them gladly. And Lord, we thank thee that you've saved them. Bless us then as we part the one from the other tonight, Lord. Take us to your homes in safety. Abide where we abide. Remember we Andy land in the hospital. Hurt as I last night, Lord. Remember Arthur, our beloved brother, who couldn't welcome us in tonight. Father, be with him. And all who are ill. And all who are in need. But Lord, we pray that tonight there will be a great ingathering of souls. And that there will be great rejoicing in the midst of the angels in heaven. Over sinners repenting and coming to thee. We ask it giving thee thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen.